Now today is July 15th. So, she will not be migrating, but she will be one of the females here in Michigan that, as long as she's around about two weeks from now, which, you know, if nothing gets her, she will be, she'll be laying eggs of the generation that will be migrating. Will you feed, or do you just want to scat, do you just want to get going? And she's off, <laughs> as it should be, as it should be. Whoa, check out this garden. There's tons of life, pollinators everywhere. Brought to you by the Rochester Pollinators. Looks like they got some good work going on here. And uh, looks like it's working. Oh, this group is not joking around, man. We got it going on. This guy's huge. We've got a male right there. That male is probably claiming this territory here. Waiting for other males to challenge. Or waiting for the ladies to drop by with a visit. It is just so cool to see like communities getting together and doing stuff like this. I mean, just look at the education that we got here. People visit this park. They're impressed by the huge amount of work put in to a pollinator garden. They see the beauty of it. They come by, they read this, and suddenly they're well aware of the monarch plate. Just the biodiversity, the life that is happening here, the activity is so awesome. I mean, if you plant it, they will come. If you make room for the life to flourish, it's going to. And it's just a beautiful park. I mean, you got this wonderful pond here. There's the pollinator garden that we were just at. And within eyesight of that, we got this stream here. And at the edge of the stream, hey, we got milkweed. So the pollinators, monarchs included, come for the nectar over there. And then a monarch comes over here, finds some milkweed, and uh, voila, lays an egg. Seems to me like the Rochester Pollinator Group's project is working. Hi, I'm Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out the monarchs, and ladies and gentlemen, they need our help. Let's not mince words or message. That help, that conservation effort, truly is in the restoration of habitat, both in the planting of milkweed and in nectar-producing flowering plants. I'm here at the Rochester Municipal Park in Rochester, Michigan, and as you can see, they've got plenty of that going on. They're doing it right. As evidenced by just the amount of life that's going on around here, the biodiversity, it looks almost to our eyes like a lot of pollinators. But ladies and gentlemen, I remember a time, not too long ago, the 1980s when I was a kid, and there were that many pollinators in almost every field. The recent episode, The Fragile Migrations, is really an unofficial part one of a three-part series, this episode being part two. And all three episodes are really meant to dive deep with you and show you the complexity, the beauty, and the fragility of these migrations, what stressors it has, and what stressors us humans are causing it. Well, in that episode, The Fragile Migrations, I showcase six areas of the unknown, things that we don't understand yet about the monarch migrations, both the eastern monarch migrations and the western. Still, that episode was a quick flyby of these six prominent areas of unknown. We only waited around in the shallow end. And as you can tell from the title you clicked on for this video, well, we're about to dive deep with one of those. In what ways are the results of climate change affecting the monarch migrations? And while the entirety of that answer might still be out of our reach, what portions of that answer we do have, we're finding a whole lot of it is all about timing. Climate change shifts in temperature, precipitation, extreme weather events, and phenology, the timing involved with biological events for plants like flowering, are already being disrupted by climate change and causing disruption to the monarch migrations. Now from what I can understand, here are the four major, most prominent concerns we have with how climate change is affecting the monarch migrations. The first area, the timing of the migrations themselves. The monarch butterfly's alarm clock, if you will, that tells it in the winter to start waking up and start heading north in the spring. And that alarm clock that also goes off for the fourth generation 
that signals to those monarchs that it's time to pack your bags and start to head south for the winter, well, those alarm clocks, that timing is based upon environmental cues. How much of these environmental cues is enough to get the correct impulse to migrate at the correct time? How much exposure to them? How many days in a row do they need to, to get that impulse? These are all still questions pretty much on the table that we're still trying to figure out. Some we know more answers to than others. But of the answers that we do have, the things that we do understand pretty well, the daylight hours that we have during the seasons and the transition to shorter daylight hours in the fall, that's something that's very important to signal to the monarchs it's time to head down south. But the changing of this day-night cycle of hours, well, that's astronomical in nature. What happens with our weather systems and what's occurring with climate change is not going to be changing anytime soon what our daylight hours and what the annual cycle is. And that's pretty much fixed. But the thing is, daylight hours, while it is the primary influencer for the migration impulse, it's not the only one. Temperatures changing in conjunction with the daylight hours changing is an intricate part of this picture. What some studies and multiple field observations have been able to show is that there have already been times where some monarchs have started migrating north early. And this has occurred when some average temperatures have been just above 2 degrees Celsius. It does appear that both in the lab and in the field that with warmer temperatures, if they're warm enough, this can actually weigh in more than the changing daylight hours as far as giving that monarch the impulse to get on the move. Furthermore, for the fall migration, it is the cooler autumn temperatures in conjunction with the changing daylight hours that signals to the monarch it's time to head out. Plenty of field observations, probably because the monarch is throughout North America, have expressed that many monarchs are hanging around a little bit later than normal because of warmer temperatures, not getting that signal to start heading down south. Not on time, anyway. Okay, so the monarchs, they show up early. What's the big deal? What's the concern? I mean, if it's warmer temperatures, shouldn't it be ready for them? Well, the first concern, of course, is, is there even going to be the, the nectar-producing flowers and the milkweed there for them? And realistically, with warmer temperatures, a lot of plant life also does get going earlier. More on that in a little bit. But if the temperatures have warmed up enough to where the migratory impulse to head north is turned on, well, that also means that the animal has come out of diapause, that they're mating, and they're looking for places to lay eggs. And if they do find some milkweed that's sprouting up early, well, it doesn't necessarily mean things are safe. We've had plenty of spells where we're getting warmer temperatures that are kind of been called a false spring in the headlines. Where, yep, it feels like spring, and in fact, it feels like spring to the monarchs enough to where they're starting to head north. And it's not a yes or no, on and off kind of switch where they all just start heading that way. It's portions of them, but still enough to where it's causing some concern and some events to happen. Such as events where monarchs have been laying eggs early because they came out of migration early and they found some milkweed that had sprouted up early, but frosts were still on the way, killing off a whole lot of eggs and the milkweed in the process. And while a false spring probably isn't going to be something that wipes out an entire population, it is something that can definitely take out a huge chunk of the first generation eggs, which are so very important to get the numbers going each year in the annual cycle. In the Midwest, particularly in the Corn Belt region, for example, there's plenty of citizen science data sets that are showing that the arrival of the monarchs in the spring is occurring about three weeks earlier than it did in the 1990s. And then on the other end of this, we also have the warmer temperatures to consider during the fall migration. As already mentioned, there's a tremendous number of citizen science reports about monarch butterflies that are hanging around later than they really should. And paired up with this are also plenty of sightings of monarchs that are making the migration just much later than the rest of the monarchs, that we're seeing more and more each year stragglers that are really late to the game. Now, admittedly, another reason for these stragglers is also because autumn is seeing a lot more severe weather, and it can be severe weather storms that cause the monarchs to delay their migration to stay and roost and shelter until better weather arrives before they continue the trip. But still, even from these extreme weather events, it doesn't explain away all of these observations of stragglers. And for these late season migrant monarchs, well, the nectar producing flowers, they're less and less each day. It's drying up, they're kind of done for the season and packing up shop. Now, does that sound like a climate change stressor? Well, with the next one, it layers on top of that one and gets it even more complex. Here we go, number two the timing of the actual milkweed. As you might likely already know, milkweed is the host plant for the caterpillars of the monarch butterfly. It's the only kind of plant that the monarch caterpillars can munch on and eat. And so this is also the only plant that mom is ever really laying the eggs on, save for a few misfires and mistakes that might happen. So definitely the milkweed plant, all the different species, as it's sprouting up across North America, it is crucial to the migration going successful as it journeys up north. The milkweed is kind of like the red carpet being rolled out for the monarch. 
and it needs to be there as the monarch arrives in order for her to have places to lay her eggs. Well, already in 2007, studies were showing that in the northern U.S., milkweed was sprouting on average two weeks earlier than it did in the 1950s. Wait, 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 Rich, pump the brakes. You just got done telling us with that first concern, the monarchs are showing up three weeks early. And so if the milkweed's sprouting up two weeks earlier, while that might not be right in sync, hey, couldn't it just be argued this is the monarchs and the milkweed adapting to the warmer temperatures? Isn't this just nature taking its course? Hey, I'll admit, an earlier migration and earlier milkweed, that's not as large of a stressor as it would be if they were very much off sync. And other than the cold snaps that can cause a frost that can kill eggs in the milkweed, it's not as severe of a problem. But we haven't talked about yet what the major problem is. It's not about the start of the milkweed, it's about how long it lasts. Think this all the way through with me. Now the milkweed starts early. It turns out that the rest of the phenology of the plant on average is also happening early. And most of the milkweed species out there, they flower just once a year. As far as the stalks go, once the seed pods have developed and the seeds are dispersed, well, those stalks are done for the year. They can, they can pack up, they can clock out. The rest of the plant, the roots, that's what's really the plant that needs to survive over the winter. So it's a waste of energy for the milkweed plants to keep on going after seed dispersal for most species. Yeah, the monarchs show up early, and there's some early milkweed there for them. The first generation eggs get laid. Let's say there's no cold snaps, everything's going great. Second generation, third generation. Once we get to fourth generation, though, they're finding that the milkweed that they are expecting to be there isn't quite there in as healthy and as nutritious of a supply. The leaves are starting to dry out, and there's just less of it. A place also on top of this, the climate change supplied stressor of droughts, which only exacerbate this problem of the milkweed drying up and being less available there for the fourth generation monarchs. So there's our milkweed timing problem, and when it comes to a population size of monarchs that's as low as it is, this is something that the monarchs and the milkweed do not have time to adapt to solve. You starting to see how complex this really is? Well, here comes number three, which is also intertwined with those first two. The timing of the nectar which truly is the fuel for both the migration and the overwintering process. Just as discussed with the milkweed, well, that's not the only plant that higher temperatures are causing the phenology to start turning on earlier. And that also means these flowering species, well, their peak time of nectar production, that's happening earlier too. And it's ending earlier. And these flowers are then having their nectar dry up earlier. The blooms are ending and shutting down. And we've got monarch butterflies still looking for food. So for fourth generation monarch butterflies that are making that very long journey, they're finding fewer and fewer fueling stations along the way. Worsening the situation, when you do have drier summers, well, some flowering plants end up producing up to 50% less nectar. There's just less fuel there at the plants. Furthermore, heightened carbon dioxide levels have been shown to reduce the potency of nectar, to have sugars that are in the nectar to be reduced by 10 to 20%. So there's fewer fueling stations, and the fuel that they're getting, well, there's less in reserve, and that fuel is less potent. All of this wrapped around climate change and increasing of temperatures. These migratory monarchs that are trying to make this trip, if they do make it, they are arriving with less fat reserves stored up from the excess nectar they were able to supply along the way. You have really got to feel for this animal. I mean, there is just so much that is stacked against it. It's the underdog that keeps fighting. But here's our last one. Not our last concern about climate change, just the last one that we're gonna tackle with this episode. But this one's not about timing. This is about Mexico's threatened microclimate, the areas where the monarch butterflies are roosting during the winter for the overwintering process. They're disappearing. A microclimate, if you didn't know, is a place where a very unique climate is, but it's in a very small region. You don't find it in other localities around the world. And the microclimates, the areas where the monarchs are roosting, are very specific, and the monarch has evolved to be able to utilize them for roosting in the overwintering process. And these very precious areas are getting completely wrecked. In some cases, it's because of direct human activity, like logging. But in other cases, it's because of much warmer temperatures just wreaking havoc on these microclimates. And these warmer temperatures are the direct result of climate change, human activity. We're messing it up, yo. Normally, these ideal conditions in those fir tree canopies keep the monarch somewhere between 0 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. And when you're on the zero side, that's the not frozen zero side of it. As temperatures rise, though, on average, there's plenty of these fir tree locations that are just too warm to be able to do this any longer. And people have not seen monarchs roosting there for multiple years. It just isn't ideal any longer. We already lost those ones. And here's where it gets, I'm sorry, pretty alarming. While we've already lost some of this area in Mexico, the loss seems like it's going to continue. And certain climate models are predicting a loss of 70% of what we have left by the year 2050. 
And for the healthy skeptics out there who might say 70% sounds a little brash, well, hey, if they're saying 70% and they're wrong and it's only 50%, that's still a major, major problem. That's still a major loss. In addition to this, for those microclimates that are still being used, that do still have this temperature range, well, they're on the warmer temperature side of that range. And so it turns out monarch butterflies are a little bit more active on average in their overwintering process and going through those energy reserves a bit more. And again, remember, they've got less of those nectar fat energy reserves because there's less flowering plants for them along the way. And they got the monarch migration journey started much later. And these monarchs are less nutritionally healthy because the milkweed was drying out during that season. This is the rocky balboa of the insect world. Now, we could dive even further and talk about how there's some bark beetles that are, because of warmer climates, starting to thrive more and are attacking these very trees, causing decimation. Or that the lack of frost because of these warmer temperatures that usually keeps fungus at bay during the winter, and instead of frost, well, they're getting humidity, fog, and precipitation. The moisture is having the fungus thrive, and it's actually causing an increase in fungal infections in the monarch butterflies as they roost. The list could go on and on, but an episode can only be so long. The point is, though, as the first three concerns brought up, not only is the migrational journey getting more and more and more brutal, but the destination itself at the end of that journey is getting more and more wrecked. Okay, so what takeaways can we glean from all of this? Again, just as Jurassic Park taught us, when it comes to a complex system, well, trying to solve the problem when you don't fully understand it can cause some chaos. you got to proceed with caution, just like any good chaotician would advise you. But some things that are very clear is that the number one way to help out is the restoration of habitat. And after this episode, hopefully you're also seeing just how very important that fall nectar truly is. So if you can, if you are ready to help, what slice of your yard can you restore habitat? Whether that be planting milkweed or nectar producing flowering plants. Don't have a yard? How can you get involved with your community to try to turn some public spaces into something a bit more pollinator friendly? I know this is still the same message but it's still an important one. If we pull together, we can make sure that this animal does not go down. And if it does, it doesn't go down without a fight. But there's one more piece to examine to really get a full understanding of this issue. And that's gonna be the topic of the next Raising Monarchs episode. I hope you check it out. Until then, thank you so much for your interest in this marvel of nature and its conservation. I'm Rich Lund, and I will see you next time.